There were so many things to buy. All kinds of knickknacks, outrigger canoes, and tiki gods, and beautiful things made of wood. If you're thinking of the idea of this being a real Polynesian culture, very clearly it is not. It is through the eyes of Americans. It really is kind of a, a borrowing of the culture, but it's really a very distorted view of the culture. Ah, hello, ah. It is showtime now in Walt Disney's enchanted tiki room. <laughs> Julie, I think you know our fine feathered friend here, Jose the host of the Enchanted Tiki Room at Disneyland? Yes, I've seen him many times there. In the Tiki 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 Room, in the Tiki 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 Room. In 1963, Walt Disney decided to build a tiki attraction in Disneyland. The South Seas fantasy, which had been defined primarily by restaurateurs and bartenders, was now about to get the master's touch. The time of the tiki had definitely arrived. In the tiki, 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 tiki room. In the tiki, 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 tiki room. All the birds sing, the flowers In the tiki, 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 tiki room. Jose, wake up. It's your time. Ah, hello, ah. Arriving at the year 1960, uh, uh, Polynesian style definitely had become the recreational style of Americans. It was associated with Hawaii. When Hawaii became a state, um, people really even felt more like they owned that culture. Aloha means both farewell and greetings, and Hawaii bids farewell to 40 years of frustration and failure in attempts to win statehood, and joyously greets its new status as a full-fledged member of the Union, its 50th state. Land of the hula of sugarcane and pineapple, with its polyglot population, brings a colorful culture as its heritage and contribution. Post-statehood uh, increase in tourism was phenomenal. There was a 30 percent increase in tourists after statehood, because the state of Hawaii went uh, purposefully, carefully, in a planned fashion, out to bring the tourists in. One paddle, two paddle, three paddle, two. Why don't you give your wife Hawaii for Christmas? Your travel agent will put all six islands into a pretty beach bag. There's a real loss of control by Hawaiians over the image that is projective of them. What is my image? Well, how do I know what people are thinking in other parts of the world? Well, look at the tourist brochures. That's how I know. Waikiki Beach at Honolulu is the backdrop for a fashion show featuring the latest in South Sea styles. Wiki is perfectly fetching when she goes into her hula number. She's a big hint at Waikiki. Some of the creations are a bit too daring for a staid Britisher, but wait till he pipes the bikini bathing suit. For a few brief, surreal moments in the early 1950s, the tiki look was actually considered fashionable, and its most popular incarnation was the Hawaiian shirt. The Hawaiian shirt received an officially sanctioned endorsement in 1951, when President Harry Truman sported a particularly flowery number on the cover of Life magazine. It was heralded as the evolution of a wardrobe. My wife says the Aloha shirt only reflects the perfect weather here, but the friendliness and gaiety of the Hawaiian people. The whole point of the Hawaiian shirt was they were, they were designed originally by missionaries to cover up the nakedness of the natives. They designed these huge, billowing, one-size-fits-all shirts. The natives, for obvious reasons, said, OK, if we have to wear these things, at least let's make them a little more colorful. And so they started taking some of the designs from the trees and the flowers around them and making them into works of art. <laughs> From tactful missionaries to tacky tourists, the Hawaiian shirt eventually came to symbolize everything that was crass and cartoonish in American culture. Uh, Hawaiian shirts are more than just something to cover the body. They're, they're more than just display. They are, in fact, an advertisement. Hey, I'm on vacation. Humor me. <laughs> But for some Americans, it wasn't enough to just slip on a Hawaiian shirt or sip on a tropical cocktail. The goal was to create a total tiki environment in the privacy of your own home. What must be remembered is this look of 
of Hawaiian or Tiki or South Seas. Most of it was created in mainland United States. Most of the bamboo furniture we love is made, was made in Brooklyn, New York. A lot of this look is about running away from technology. The idea of the white man's Garden of Eden and this feeling of refuge. It is feasible to have the fantasy of sitting on a beach under a palm tree looking out at the Pacific, even though you're sitting in on your bamboo sofa in Des Moines, Iowa, staring out at your back garden. Tiki architecture, a style where the South Pacific met the Space Age, began to sprout up all across the American landscape. Apartment complexes like these were designed primarily to attract the swinging singles crowd. Investors realized that people were equating Polynesian style with leisure, with fun, with a freer lifestyle. So they designed apartment buildings in that style. These apartment buildings were often advertised as bachelor apartments. Around the pools, you had luau barbecue pits, promising a more of a party atmosphere, more of a pre-swinger lifestyle. Unfortunately, by the late 1960s, the proverbial tiki torch, which once burned so bright, was now dwindling to a flicker. Tiki looks especially good in inhibited times. I think that's why uh, it was popular in, in the 50s. And once people actually started acting out the fantasies as opposed to just fantasizing about them, I think Tiki started disappearing. Tiki had come to embody the very values it was meant to replace. Why get high with Martin Denny when you had Jimi Hendrix? For young Americans, Tiki was now paradise lost, the last refuge of a tired, bloated, and flaccid generation. One of the more amazing aspects of this phenomenon is where it disappeared so completely. It pretty quickly became an embarrassment to most, almost everybody involved. And, and they just sort of, you know, hid their tikis or got rid of them. There is, however, one man who never hid his tikis. In fact, he built a shrine for them. Located near Los Angeles, this was probably the only amusement park ever devoted solely to tiki culture. It was the brainchild of an entrepreneur named Danny Boltz. Unfortunately, few others shared his tiki vision. I saw this, I said, wow, this, this is a place. The freeway was close by, and, and I said, I'll start it right here. This in here, I was going to bring, out, I want to have outrigger rides, take the people of the island, bring them back, real romantic, kind of. And these volcanoes are going to erupt the time of the music, and I was going to have dancers up on, up on top of There's a lot of plateaus up where the dancers are going to be dancing. I have one, two, three, about six drums in here as the people come in. And I made it nice and wide because I expected big crowds. Danny made up this photo brochure to illustrate just what the park might look like when fully operational. Sadly, the Tiki's, which was built in 1984, never opened. I want to excite them. Wow, this is it, man. I, want, I, I can't see it all in one weekend. I got to come back. And this down here, this was all seating area, so it gave it a crater effect. It was going to be dancing down here. Danny was convinced that if he just built a bigger and better Tiki, that the people would come. But they didn't. Now bankrupt, he lives in a trailer within the confines of this strange lava land, still hoping that one day, Tiki might just make a comeback. I went to Hawaii, I talked to a lot of people and said, the more Tiki gods you have around your place, the better luck you'll have. So I start carving Tikis and, you know, just put them all over the place. And I was able to get the 30-foot Tiki god over here and I put that up there. And, and I had luck with it, you know, but just my luck ran out. I spent like $3 million on the place, never got off the ground. I might be crazy, but I got a dream. <laughs> Tiki was a purely populist or pop culture phenomenon. It was very loved by the people, but discarded and, and shunned by 
culture critics and writers. The elitists were demanding more authenticity. The people didn't care, they, they didn't know better. So they just had fun with it.